welcome to the show. I'm your host, Jacqueline Yvonne, and this is Talk About. Joining me today is a author, filmmaker, and uh, public speaker. And she's the author of After the Bungee Jump, There's Still a Lot of Jerking Going <laughs> On. And I'd like to welcome Doris Mangrum. Thank, Welcome. Thank, thank you, you so for being much. here today. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, that's really an interesting title, <laughs> and I want to talk about it a little bit later. Okay. But first, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your background, because I know you work for correctional um, uh, institutions, mm -hmm. and um, you've worked with uh, incarcerated mm -hmm. uh, people. So mm -hmm. let's kind of talk about your background first. Okay, for the last 20 years, I've worked uh, in a correctional facility working with families and children. I teach a parenting class for unification life skills. And we do an enhanced visitation with the children, allowing them to come and have contact visits with their families on the weekend, for their incarcerated parent on the weekend. What we found is that when folks get together with their children and see their family during their period of incarceration, it's a lot easier for them to transition back into the family. So I've worked in that program for uh, almost 20 years. I've done a mentoring program with Children of the Incarcerated, uh, transformative mentoring program, overseeing that. Then a drop-in care center with families that were trying to get back on their feet with their careers, that kind of thing. Work with families in the home in family preservation programs, uh, programs that are designed to help families who may have a challenge with parenting or have a challenge with um, you know, putting food on the table or housing, whatever their, their needs are to help them get those things accomplished and so they can keep the families together. Okay. Worked with relative caregivers, primarily grandparents working with their, their grandchildren for variety of reasons, mm -hmm. oftentimes because of an incarcerated parent, to help them navigate through that because you know with grandparents, um, they were going into their golden years and now all of a sudden here they're stuck with maybe their little ones on a regular basis, not just for the weekend, not just right. to take them to the movies. So you have grandparents 70, 80 years old caring for three or four children under the age of 10. It can be challenging because so many things have changed, so I've done that as well. While dividing my time <laughs> as a community relations manager for a nonprofit, and what that does is I just connect that nonprofit to um, programs and corporate corporations that are in the community to help them and help us get more visibility. So how did you decide to take that direction with your career, to end up working with correctional uh, institutions and, and uh, you know, with the incarcerated? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a, a, a unique career. You know, I think, Jack, it goes back to when I was a little girl, you know, I, I, and when I got this, this idea that I like to help. My parents both were very, very poor, and, um, but they did well in their life, both became college mm -hmm. professors, but they never forgot where they came from. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we were always doing something for folks, giving them folks food, money, clothing, and so I was the liaison person. I would be the mm -hmm. deliverer of the food and all these things, and I got to the place where I would even find people that needed help, and I'd tell mom and dad about it. So it was in me to help others. And as a result of that, you know, once I found my, my, my stride, I found myself, I worked in corporate America for uh -huh. a little bit and got out of that once I began to have my own children and then got into child development. And so there I was able to meet families and, you know, get accustomed to working again with uh, direct service. And I got into uh, helping families again, and that's where my heart has always mm -hmm. been. So it started out as a little girl, actually. Wow. Yeah. That's really <laughs> interesting. And so that brings us to your book mm -hmm. and your unique book title. So tell us about the title of the book. Wow. After the bungee jump, there's still a lot of jerking going on. I don't know if you've ever been on a bungee jump. No, and I <laughs> doubt very seriously that I ever will. Have you actually? No, I have not. <laughs> I have actually only seen them yes, either uh -huh. on television or in person. I've seen mm -hmm. them as people doing them. But the one thing I noticed about a bungee jump is this that the only safe place to me is on the landing mm -hmm. and the minute they step off the landing it's jerking right and so I wanted the book title to uh, to cover what I believe families go through uh, when they have a family member that's mm -hmm. incarcerated so for me the actual jumping off the landing represents the commission of the crime mm -hmm. you know that place that where the person says well I'm gonna do this I think I can get away with it but the moment they step off of it they recognize okay I'm, I'm done I'm in trouble it's too late and mm -hmm. then if you've ever really paid attention to them even at the bottom of the bungee jump even when they're at the end mm -hmm. of the court it's still jerking mm -hmm. and so that represented to me the yanking of the lives that were connected to that mm -hmm. bungee jumper that are in disarray, families that are connected, you know, loved mm -hmm. ones who are connected. As a result of this person's commission of the crime, now their lives are going to be thrown into, uh, wow. uh, yeah, into what disarray. A, what an interesting <laughs> title, and, and, and it all fits. It yeah. makes such sense yeah. when you explain it. <laughs> wow. So then let's talk about your book, you know, mm -hmm. and what, what information it contains and, and uh, um, you know, how it can help people. 
Okay, well, the book is, um, it follows a mother's eight years of incarceration, and it follows um, the family for that same period of eight years. So you're looking at the book, when you're reading the book, the, 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 the reader gets a chance to see it from the perspective of the mother who is behind bars and also from the perspective of the family mm -hmm. that's on the outside. So both are going through, and you know, like in many cases people will say they're both doing time, right. if you will. Exactly. So the, the, the reader gets a mm -hmm. chance to see what's happening to that person on the inside, but also that there's collateral damage. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes what we, we forget that there's a family connected to the person that's incarcerated. We're so busy uh, f you know, focusing on the offender, we're not recognizing that now this family is thrown into disarray. Right. And throwing into disarray, might, they may have to move. The mother or the father that's left behind now has to become the nurturer, mm -hmm. the caregiver, the breadwinner all in one. Uh, they may have uh, to bring grandma in, which mm -hmm. you know, is, I told mm -hmm. you about working with grandparents, to help, help with the, the child caregiving. So everything is thrown off kilter as a result. And the additional thing about incarceration is it's a different type of separation than almost any other type of separation because there's shame that goes along with right. it. A lot of times people keep their secret secret because they don't want people to know that they've got a family shame, member. Shame, guilt, yeah. all mm -hmm. kind of, I, I would imagine, emotional feelings depending yeah, on Yeah, because people point happening. their fingers, mm -hmm. they whisper, mm -hmm. they, they isolate people as if the people who are left behind have committed some crime right. as well. So right. one of the things that's important for me with writing the book was to get out to help people recognize, one, that we do these things, mm -hmm. and two, the damage that it's doing, and then to have people to reflect upon why. Right. And that exactly. we would begin to change the way that we um, respond to people. Who right. And you touched on it a little bit, but one of the things that you do say is that it's not only the person that does the crime that does the time, it is also the family left Absolutely. behind. And, and that is really, really true. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, what, what you, you, you have a nonprofit organization as well mm -hmm. um, that kind of ties into all of this. Yes. And, uh, and I, I will probably mess it up, but it's Say Diana. Say Diana. You know, I tell Say people Diana. when everyone tries to, to say the word, to think about Idi Amin, I said, and they said, well, I know you don't really want to think <laughs> right, about Idi exactly. Amin. But the, the, it's Diana. a Swahili word for help each other. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do with actually the name of my, of my work was to, to embody what I want us to do. I want us to wrap around this population. There are millions of people in prison, mm -hmm. so there are millions more that are left behind. Right. So my uh, nonprofit is called Say Ediana Works. Say Ediana. And what Say Ediana does, uh, Say Ediana Works does, is has training and support and resources, and it brings together the people that have been on the inside with the people on the outside. It mm -hmm. can be done either on the inside and on the outside at different mm -hmm. places simultaneously with both once the person is released. And so the idea is to get people to recognize that they both have changed during the separation. Not just the person who was incarcerated, right, but the right. people on the outside. And so if they can begin to understand that it's not going to be the way it was when you left five, six, mm -hmm. seven years ago, because that then begins to sabotage the reunification. Because if I keep looking to you thinking that, well, it is, that's not the way it was when mm -hmm. we used to be, well, it's not going to be that way. And so as we continue to look for it to be that way, we're ruining the relationship. But if we know that things have changed, you've changed, I've changed, we've changed, we start from that point, then we're able to begin to move exactly. into a new place from where we are today. Exactly. So it works with looking at what separation has done to families mm -hmm. and understanding that we all have changed and moving from that place and also to get on the same page about what to do with the children, how to parent again, you know, recognizing mm -hmm. that that child who has run to grandmother for eight years now right. may pass right by you when they need some assistance because you haven't been there and not to be offended by that but to understand it. So little things like that will help the person to begin right. to recognize that that, you know, it's not because they don't like me or they don't care about me. I just haven't been available. And right. as I begin to be available again, that that child who had been be passing me will begin to come to me and recognize that I'm so back So in, in working with the, the families and the children, does a lot of your work also... Um, uh, deal with, you know, because you mentioned the trauma and whatnot, mm -hmm. but um, can you imagine some of the trauma that young children are going through when they see a parent being handcuffed and, and, and you know, led away or, or a, ra a raid on the home, you know, so I'm just wondering what type of emotional tra scars are left behind it, with it those can children. Be, it can be awful for mm -hmm. a child, but that's why the, it comes in. It's such a great thing for the program that I have where mm -hmm. they get to actually visit with their parent. Mm -hmm. Because you know, it's one thing for someone to tell you about someone and tell you that they're okay and that right. they're doing fine, but it's a whole different thing when you can see it for yourselves. So we have children who have not seen their parents, say, six, seven, eight months, mm -hmm. and then they come to visit them for the very first time 
time. So then their all of the pain and all of the, the fear mm -hmm. that they had about their parent is alleviated right. once they actually see them for themselves. So what I've heard from parents who are on the outside is that that child's behavior will change in school, that they're better at home because they want to see their mom or dad. Mm -hmm. They want to get to do that visit again. So parents have even used it for leverage mm -hmm. <laughs> to help the child right. uh, act better at home. So. What I find is that, you know, on television, the, the way that um, we see uh, what prison played mm -hmm. out, it, 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 they, they show a very bad picture. Right. Our program, it's, it's child-appropriate and age-appropriate games and activities for the children to get together with their parents. Mm -hmm. So when they leave there, they have a smile on their face. You would never mm -hmm. know they've been in a correctional facility. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day... And, and does that depend on the, the, the correctional facility? Because I would imagine, depending on where someone is incarcerated, yes. uh, that it would be different in each place because I don't know if these programs that you're describing are... Across Nation, the board. Yeah, nationwide. No, you know. no, there are various levels of programs. Um, I'm just fortunate to work in a mm -hmm. program that allows contact visiting. Right. Uh, every program, every uh, facility does not have something mm -hmm. at this level. But when it is child appropriate, age appropriate, mm -hmm. it's great. So mm -hmm. find out. I, I encourage people to find out as much as they can about the facility where their loved one may be housed right. to see what uh, programs that are available. But if they can, and if it is mm -hmm. age appropriate, mm -hmm. that it is a good thing. And sometimes, you know, there may be this you know, strain between the right. adults, but we right. have to look at what's going to be in the best interest of the children and, and you know, what they're wanting in many cases in this particular instance. Right. It may be just that one time or two times so that they know that the parent is okay and that they've touched them, they've seen it for themselves. The other thing is I think it's very important for family members to let family member the little family members know where their parent is mm -hmm. because, you know, when you tell them these stories about well, they're in the military or right. they're away working. Well, the child is sophisticated enough in their thinking to recognize, well, don't they get a day off? Right. Aren't they able to right. call well, sometimes? Well, I, I think one of the biggest uh, issues would be to tell the truth yes. to the child, you know, Absolutely. rather than, you know, like you say, trying to hide the facts. Yes. Because children are smart. They Absolutely. know something's wrong. They Absolutely. know, you know, they can read between the lines. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that that is really critical. But... Um, um, and just think, thinking in terms of, you know, when you're talking about the incarcerated pa parent and, and, and visiting and whatnot, I would think that there's a lot of things that, transitional things that families need to know uh, just about someone being incarcerated, for instance, even how to go visit them, how mm -hmm. to write a letter to them, what's the proper way, can you send them money? I mean, do you help with, with that, all that aspect with, as Yes, well? that can, it depends on what the facility is. We can mm -hmm. find that information out for them as well. You know, you know we get, we, we, what we do is we try to help people to, we empower people mm -hmm. to get information for themselves okay. and how to call mm -hmm. and how to get information. A lot of facilities don't necessarily have all that they need to mm -hmm. be connected with. Right. This is one of the things I'm trying to push for, mm -hmm. that correctional facilities will become more sensitive to the people that are left behind right. and recognize these are, our, these are our allies. These folks who are wanting to keep their family member connected are folks in the long run who will be able to help us keep folks on the outside. Mm -hmm. The recidivism problem a lot of times has to do with, of course, people not being able to get jobs and good mm -hmm. housing and financial assistance, but it also happens because we have not taken care of the families that have been left mm -hmm. behind. Mm -hmm. If they come back to, if a person who's been incarcerated comes back to a family that's strong and has been supported by the community, Community, there's a greater chance that that family now can motivate that person to stay home. Right, but right. if the family's in disarray because of all the things they've tried to do and not had support of the community, then in addition to that person not being able to get jobs, housing, and financial mm -hmm. assistance, they got a family that's falling apart. So their first, the first law of nature is self-preservation. They're going to go out and do what they and, need to do with their family. And I can see a lot of families being left in disarray Absolutely. because it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, again, we talk about the trauma of the whole experience, but I would think that a lot of times it's the breadwinner mm -hmm. that's taken away, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and in prison, and, mm -hmm. you know, they may have been doing some illegal things to, to make the money to feed mm -hmm. the family, but, um, you know, so your money's gone. You talk mm -hmm. about that kind of a hardship. Mm -hmm. Now you're faced with financial mm -hmm. hardship, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, and then, too, I, I would think um, one of the obstacles would be transportation a lot of times because depending on where that person is sent, to be incarcerated, there could be miles and miles and miles in between, you know, so, a very important yeah, thing. Yes. talk about that aspect a little bit. Okay, transportation, um, once a person is sentenced, let's say if they're doing more mm -hmm. time than, let's say, a few months in city mm -hmm. or county jail, typically the city and county jail is going to be close to where the person committed the crime, and if it happens to have been committed where they live, then they're going to be mm -hmm. pretty close to their family. But then once sentencing has occurred and a person is placed in prison, 
a lot of these prisons are in Timbuktu, if right. you will. Right. And they're in places that are not only a distance away, 100 plus, plus miles away, but typically places that are not accessible by public transportation. Mm -hmm. So a family has to have a car that runs on a regular basis, you right. know, is, is, is reliable, and then have the finances to support that. Additionally, I know that one of the things people may not think about is the fact that telephone calls Telephone calls, just to make a simple telephone call from the prison, cost up to 10 times as much as you and I pay. Mm -hmm. So then you're talking about that surcharge on that. So families then begin to have to budget just mm -hmm. to make this happen. Mm -hmm. So then in order to help the family members stay family also, we're talking about putting money on people's books. When you hear people talk about money on books, so they can get soap and toiletries mm -hmm. and things that they need to feel like they're human in a situation that doesn't provide them with these things, you know, just on a, on right. a standard and basis. There, and there's a process for that, too. It's not like you can just send them some money and in the mail oftentimes. I mean, there's a certain way that you have to, procedure that you have to go through to even get your loved one. Facility by facility, right, will, you know, it right, will be different, on, but yeah. you, that's why it's important to find out, you know, who the people are to, mm -hmm. to contact and get the information as, as best you can. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times, you know, when you go out to visit, only to find out things and rules have changed. So all of these are the kinds of things that talk that I talk about families right. being thrown into disarray. Right. So when they're trying to do all that they can do to keep that family member connected, they're going through a lot of frustration just to make that happen. Well, I would just be so up in the air, you know, not knowing what to do, you know, if someone that I, I love was in prison, you mm -hmm. know, so, and I'm sure this is how most of these families feel when mm -hmm. it happens to mm -hmm. them. And uh, just like you were uh, talking about um, going to visit, I mean, I have this impression of, you know, going in and, and being strip searched or searched, or, you know, oh. I don't know what they do, you know, <laughs> depending on the, the different facilities, but I think it's just having to educate someone so that they know, okay, well, what you, you know, they may open your purse or they may, you know, pat you down mm -hmm. or, you know, I, everything that you need to know. I mean, I would just be totally up in the air. Yeah. So I would love to have someone that's holding my hand Absolutely. to help me through. Because mm -hmm. you already, you know, you're already in shock because mm -hmm. all along the way up until sentencing, you're believing that your loved one is going mm -hmm. to be miraculously set free right and then you have to you know gear in for right. the fact that okay this person is going to be in and maybe in for quite some time right. so all of these things in addition to what we just right. talked about right. having you know the phone calls the distances right. away how you treat it during the visitation those right. kinds of things the access to information being sometimes tricky in order to get right. but it's if you persevere and if you keep going at it you can get the information yeah. that you have. I, and so my old goal scary, is to make sure yeah scary it is. time for yeah, people absolutely scary time it for is. people one of the things too that I noticed and I, I know um, I read either on your website or mm -hmm. in talking with you that you do now work more with women incarcerated women is, um, and and the numbers uh, women, the, the numbers are really increasing. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're they're they've doubled that of men going in yes. uh, into prison. And what what's going on here? <laughs> the tricky thing is the drugs. Mm -hmm. The drugs have uh, you know the drugs hit us about thirty years ago. Period. Mm -hmm. You know, not just for women. We we had the drug war, mm -hmm. if you will, and then we started putting people in. You know, with mandatory sentencing, three strikes mm -hmm. you're out. Uh, truth in sentencing, where we're throwing the key away. And then on top of that, we then did this after punishment thing, where people are coming back, right. and then you can't get jobs, housing. So mm -hmm. all of that has s snowballed right. into seeing our communities falling apart. Folks are not available to take care of their children because they've been gone for so long, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But back to your question about the women, 